Hello and welcome back to another full step-by-step -step PC build guide where I'm going to be showing you how to put all the parts I've got in front of me together today to come up with a fully working PC by the end of the video. So take a look at the parts I've chosen for today's build. For the case I'm going with the Gamdeus Talos E3 which is a mid-tower case, fairly compact in size but can still accommodate a full-sized ATX motherboard. For the motherboard I'm going to be using the ASRock B660 Steel Legend. For the CPU, I'm going to be using Intel's 12th Gen i7, the 12700K. Keeping our CPU cool, I've got a 240mm AIO from Gamdeus. It's the Keon M3. For storage, I'm going with a single M.2 NVMe drive for this build. It's the Sabrent Rocket in 500GB capacity. For RAM, I've got 32GB of Kingston Fury Beast RGB at 3600MHz. Powering the whole build, I've got a 750W gold non-modular power supply from Gamdeus. It's the Kratos P1A. For the graphics card, I'm going to be using the MSI Gaming X RTX 3050. And the final part for today's build is some white cable extensions from Cable Mod. Okay, let's get on with the build. The first thing I want to do is prepare the case. As we go, I'll point out the case's main features. So our tempered glass side panel is held on before thumb screws, so we'll go ahead and remove these. And with the thumb screws removed, we should simply be able to slide the panel out and away. To remove the other side panel, we've got another two thumb screws to remove. And then the panel can be slid backwards and away. At the back of the case we've got an accessory bag. I'm going to remove this and I'll show you what's contained in here later on. The front panel is removed by pulling it away from the front. Taking a look at the case's front I.O. we've got a power button. We've got a button labelled LED which is to control the lighting on our fans. We've got two USB 2.0 ports and a single USB 3.0 port and a separate headphone and microphone jack. The magnetic dust filter at the top of the case can simply be pulled away. Moving into the main body of the case, despite the compact size, we can actually fit full-sized ATX motherboards, but if you prefer, you can go with a micro ATX or mini ATX motherboard. In terms of CPU cooler height, it's up to 160mm in height, and graphics cards up to a maximum length of 300mm are supported. In terms of the PCIe expansion slots, we've got seven horizontal slots at the back of the case. In terms of fan support, as you can see, we've got three 120mm fans pre-installed and these do have RGB on them. Um, in terms of the maximum fan support, at the front you can fit up to three 120 or two 140mm fans. It's two 120 at the top and a single 120 at the rear. In terms of radiator support at the front, it's either up to a 360 or 280mm radiator, up to a 240 at the top and up to a 120 at the rear. Um, you can also fit two 120mm fans at the bottom above the power supply shroud. The only other thing to mention about the front of the case is we do have two mounting places here for two and a half inch drives. Moving into the rear compartment, you can see we've got a hard drive cage at the bottom, which will accommodate a two three and a half inch or two and a half inch drives. As we're not going to be installing any of these drives, we're going with a single M.2 drive and going to remove the hard drive cage. To remove our hard drive cage, we need to loosen the four screws on the outside and remove the two middle screws. That's going to allow us to slide the hard drive cage up and away. The other thing to point out, you'll notice we've got an extra set of holes further towards the left hand side and this is going to allow us to remove our hard drive further to the front of the case, increasing the space for our power supply. And the other thing to point out is we do have a dust filter here over the power supply's intake. We should now be able to slide our hard drive cage towards the back of the case, lift it up and away. So this is what comes in the case accessory bag. So we've got some cable ties for cable management. We've got some additional standoffs. We've got some large screws for securing our power supply. We've got some screws for securing SSDs. And we've also got screws for securing our motherboard. We're now ready to start working the motherboard and we're going to install our CPU, the bracket for our CPU killer, our RAM and our M.2 SSD all before we put the motherboard into the case. To install our CPU, the first thing we need to do is push this lever down and out and all the way to the top and then we're going to be able to open the cover. We can then lower our CPU down into the socket, lining the notches on the CPU up with the notches on the socket at the top and the bottom, and making sure the text on the CPU is the correct way up. And then all we need to do is close the cover over. If we apply a little bit of pressure here, quite often the back bit of plastic will pop off. If it doesn't, we can just close the lever over, and there we go, it's popped off now. And then we can put this into the motherboard box. To install our M.2 SSD, we need to first remove the heatsink. It's held on with two screws. We can then insert the drive into the socket at a slight angle, flatten it down, and what you'll notice is the same screw that's going to secure our heatsink is going to secure our drive in place. 
Just before we return the heat sink, there's some plastic protection on the back we're going to need to remove. We are now ready to install a ram, so I'm going to open the clips on all four slots because I've got four sticks. If you've only got two sticks, it's going to be the second and fourth slot along from the CPU that you're going to want to install it in. I'm then going to line the RAM up with the slot. Once I'm happy I've got everything lined up, it's just some firm pressure at the top, and the RAM is going to clip into place. And then it's the same thing with the other three sticks. Next we need to install the backplate for our CPU killer. Importantly, there's a number of different backplates that come in the packaging. We want the one that's labelled LGA1700. Now, if the screws here don't line up with the holes in the back of the motherboard, these are adjustable. You can pull these yellow clips in and out. I've got that lined up now, so it should fit through the back of the motherboard. Then we've just got one of these standoffs to go on to each corner. Just before we install our motherboard into the case, we need to install our I.O. shield. It just needs to be pushed into the cutout at the back, taking care not to cut yourself. Next, we're going to need to add three additional standoffs to the back of the case. So you'll notice six of our standoffs are pre-installed here, but we're going to have to add another three just in line with the standoffs over here. So nine in total for our full-sized ATX motherboard. Now, unfortunately, Gamdias didn't include the standoff insertion tool. I've got one here from another case. Basically, the standoff goes into this, and then you're going to be able to screw it in to the back of the case. If you don't have one of these tools, you can either pick yourself up one, or alternatively, you can use a pair of pliers to screw the standoff into the back of the case. We can then insert the motherboard into the case, line that up with the standoffs and the I.O. shield at the back. We can then secure the motherboard into place using nine screws from the accessory bag. Next thing to do is get our case cables plugged in, so our HD audio cable is going to go into this header down the bottom left hand side of the motherboard. So we'll bring it up through the cutout, line it up with the header and push into place. And then we'll pull the excess cable through to the back. Two headers along to the right, we've got one of the motherboard's three ARGB headers. So we bring the ARGB cable coming from our case through, line it up and push into place. At the middle of the motherboard at the bottom, we've got a USB 2.0 header, so we'll bring our cable through, line it up, and push into place. Then we've got our front panel connectors, they're going to go into this header here. So starting off with the bottom row, pins 1 and 2 from the left hand side are for hard drive LED positive and hard drive LED negative. So we're going to need to plug the cable in with the text facing down the way. Moving up to the top row, and again working from left to right, pins 1 and 2 are for power LED positive and power LED negative. The two pins beside that are for our power switch. It doesn't matter which way it goes around, I'm just going to plug it in with the text facing down the way. And then again, we'll just pull the cables through to the back. Our USB 3.0 cable is going to go into this header here, so we'll line it up with the motherboard and push into place. We're now ready to install our power supply. Importantly, this is our power supply's intake fan, so we're going to want to install it facing down where it's going to get cooler from the bottom of the case. Then we can secure the power supply into place using the four larger screws from the accessory bag. Just before we leave the power supply, there's two buttons I want to point out at the back. The first is the silent mode. It's currently set to on, which is the way I want it. So it means when the power supply is under low load, the fan stops spinning, which is going to help reduce the noise in our build. The other is the RGB lighting mode. And because our fan on the power supply does have RGB on it, if you don't want to connect it up to your motherboard, you can actually cycle through the various effects by pressing this button. And there's 30 different effects built into the power supply, including turning the RGB lighting off. Alternatively, you can connect the power supply up to your motherboard and let your motherboard software control the lighting. And to sync with the motherboard, all you need to do is hold this button for three seconds, obviously once the PC is powered on, and that will then sync the lighting up on the fan on the power supply with your motherboard. So as I mentioned, I was going to use some white cable extensions, so I've plugged in a cable to our PCIe cable and also our 24-pin cable. I'm not going to use one for the 8-pin EPS cable because once we install our radiator at the top, we're not actually going to see the cable. And cable management at the back is made more difficult by using cable extensions. So we're going to get no benefit from our cable at the top, but we're going to have more difficulty managing the cables. So our 8-pin EPS cable is going to go into this header at the top left-hand side of the motherboard. So we'll bring it through the cutout. Line it up with the header and push into place. Our 24 pin cable is going to go into this header here. So we'll bring it through the cutout, line it up, push into place, and then we've got some cable combs on the cable to help organize it. 
As I've mentioned, our power supply can be connected up to the motherboard to control the ARGB lighting. We've got two further ARGB headers here at the top right hand side of the motherboard, so I'm just going to plug the cable coming from our power supply into one of those headers. The final cable for us to connect up is the SATA cable coming from our fans. Unfortunately, all our fans are powered by SATA rather than plugging into one of the fan headers on the motherboard. The downside of this is that we cannot control the fan speed. They're going to run at 100%. And previously, I have not recommended this sort of fans because they tend to run very noisily. So we'll have to do some testing at the end to see if this remains true. So all we need to do is plug this into one of the SATA cables coming from our power supply. We're now ready to start working the I.O. so we can set our fans onto the radiator. And then we're going to secure them into place using the included long radiator screws. So I'm going to talk you through the wiring while we have the I.O. on the table. So coming from each of our fans, we've got two wires. We've got a four pin PWM fan connector and we've got a three pin five volt ARGB connector. So starting off with the four pin PWM fan connectors, in the pack we get a double fan splitter cable, so we can plug each of the cables into this. So that leaves us one four pin PWM fan connector, which we're gonna plug into the CPU fan header on our motherboard. So taking a look at the ARGB connectors, we do have an additional connector allowing us to daisy chain them together. So we take the connector coming from our other fan, line up the connectors, and then push them into place. We're then going to plug this end into one of the ARGB headers on our motherboard. Unfortunately, our motherboard does have three ARGB headers, so we're going to have just the right amount that we need. We do have another splitter cable on the end, which we're going to be able to plug in the ARGB connector on our pump into here. So coming from our pump, again, we've got two connectors. One is an ARGB connector, which we're going to plug into the splitter cable coming from the fans. The other is a four pin PWM connector, which we're going to plug into the AIO pump header on our motherboard. Now we are going to need to put the brackets onto the cooler and the brackets that you're going to want to use depend on the mounting. So we're going to need to use the LGA 1700 brackets. Okay, so this is our LGA 1700 brackets that we're going to need to attach to our pump. Before we do, we've got these little pads to go on to the top of them. There's adhesive on one side, so I'm going to go ahead and remove that. And then importantly, with the screws facing up the way, we just want to stick this on, lining it up with the holes. Then we're going to want to set the brackets onto the pump and then screw them in from underneath. Now the only other thing I do want to mention about the pump is I've already rotated this logo around 180 degrees because the way I want to install this in the case of I hadn't, the GAMDS logo would be upside down. In some IIOs, it's really simple. You just simply rotate it and it will go round. Unfortunately, this doesn't seem to work for me anyway with this IIO. And what I've had to do is just pull this front bit off. Um, if you do wedge in under here and work your way round, it is quite difficult to remove. I haven't, that's why I haven't shown you it on the camera, but it is possible to do. So it's just a matter of pulling this off, rotating it round and then pushing it back on. And the final thing to mention about our IIO, if your motherboard doesn't have an ARGB header, all you would need to do is plug the ARGB connector coming from the fans into here, plug this into a SATA cable coming from your power supply, and then you can press this button to cycle through the various ARGB effects. Next thing to do is to add some thermal paste to the CPU, and it is included with the cooler. Before we install our I.O., we need to remove the plastic protection from the cold plate. Then we just need to lower the I.O. down and line it up with the bracket we installed earlier on. And then we can just tighten up the screws. I'm then just going to route the wires coming from our connectors in underneath the brackets. And we're just going to pass the ARGB cable through to the back for now. We'll do the same with the PWM connector. And we're going to plug it into our pump header, which is just here at the top of the motherboard. So just to add a correction here, don't copy what I'm doing. This is actually a system fan header that I'm plugging the cable coming from the pump into. The CPU pump header is actually the header at the top right hand side of the motherboard beside the two ARGB connectors. And then we'll push the excess cable through to the back. We can then remove the plastic protection from the pump. You might be wondering why I've installed the pump first, whereas normally if you watch my videos, I'll put the radiator on. 
The reason for this is with our radiator and our fans at the top, we're not actually going to have access to any of these headers at the top that we're going to need. Next I'm going to slide our radiator round into place. And I'm just going to pass all the cables through to the back. So you can see now with our radiator installed, there's absolutely no way for us to access the fan headers at the top of the case. So we'll bring the radiator again out of the way slightly. And I'm going to bring back through our PWM connector coming from our fans and plug it into our CPU fan header, which is just here. The other cable that I'm going to need to bring back through is one of the RGB connectors coming from the fans and plug it into one of the RGB headers, which is just here at the right hand side of the motherboard. OK, so with all our cables plugged in, we can raise our IO up towards the top. And as we go, just pull all the cables coming from the fans through to the back. Then we can secure the radiator at the top using the screws that came with it. Then we can replace the dust filter at the top. At the back of the case, then all we need to do is plug the RGB connector coming from our pump into the RGB splitter cable coming from our fans. We're now ready to install our graphics card and we're going to need to remove the second and third expansion slot cover from the top. To get access to the slots, we just need to remove this cover. And the slot covers in this case simply break away. So all we need to do is push it down from the top and we bend it up and down a few times, it will eventually just pop off. And then same thing with the one below it. And then we can open the clip in the top PCIe slot. We can insert our graphics card into the case, line it up with the slot. Once we're happy everything's lined up, it's just some firm pressure to the graphics card. It's going to clip into place. Then we need to use two of the same screws that we secured our power supply with to secure the graphics card into place. And then we can replace the cover. So we'll just slide it in through here, slot it into place, and then secure it with the thumb screw. We can then bring our PCI cables through the cutout at the bottom and get them plugged in to the graphics card. And then we've got some cable combs on the cable which we're going to help organise the cable. Final thing for us to do is some cable management. We're going to get this message cables tidied up so we can get our side panel back on again. We've got some cable ties in the accessory bag to help tidy things up and plenty of cable tie points. And again, we've got plenty of space at the bottom because we removed the hard drive cage for our power supply cables. So I think you'll agree the PC looks great. I've gone ahead and set it up and haven't recorded those steps because in my Fractal Torrent Compact build, I used another ASRock motherboard with the same CPU. So if you actually don't know how to install Windows, install the drivers and get the fan curve set up and adjust the RGB, you'll find a link to that video in the description and the steps for that are gonna be exactly the same, even though it's a slightly different motherboard. Setting up the ASRock motherboards are very similar. So you'll be able to follow that guide if you need to know how to do that. So the next thing I want to do is take a look at the temperatures. So you can see the temperatures on the screen and I have to say these are very reasonable for this CPU being cooled with a 240mm AIO, particularly set to the top as exhaust. Noise levels are actually better than what I was expecting them to be. They're probably at the higher end of the moderate range. But given the type of fans that we've got with SATA connectors where we can't adjust the speed, these are actually pretty good. One additional thing to point out, you'll have noticed during the build that I used the silent button on the power supply. You're definitely going to want to do this because whenever I turned it off, the idle noise increased up to 54 decibels. So that's a whopping 18 decibels of extra noise just by running the power supply not in silent mode. So I'm sure some of you are wondering about this front glass panel and how restrictive it actually is. 
So I went ahead and ran the same thermal tests with the front panel removed. So the main thing to point out here that our CPU temperatures only dropped by two degrees by removing the front panel, telling me that it's not actually that restrictive. So hopefully this test will put your mind at rest about the front panel. You're only getting a very minor increase in temperatures with this front panel on. Two degrees means the front panel is very unrestrictive. There's a large gap at the side. Um, the fans are actually set back behind the gap, so they're no problem pulling plenty of air in. And in fact, when I've tested other cases with a good mesh front panel, removing it, the temperatures only fell by one or two degrees. So actually this is still pretty good. And I think it looks absolutely stunning, the glass on the front. So you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting great looks and only a very mild restriction with the front panel. So this brings me on to my experience of building in the Gamdeus Talos E3. And in general, everything was really good. It's lovely to have a case which takes up such a small footprint on your desk, but yet you're still able to fit a full-sized ATX motherboard in. In terms of problems during the build, the main problem for me was plugging our pump header into a system fan header rather than a CPU fan header. Um, so just be aware of that. I didn't check the diagram in the motherboard manual before plugging it in, because normally you have your two CPU fan headers together. In this motherboard, you have one CPU fan header, then a system fan header, then the, the other CPU fan header along the top. So again, if you're going to plug the cables in, just make sure you check the diagram in the motherboard manual. I don't think I'm going to be the only one doing this. The other slight potential problem you might come into is with a 240mm radiator at the top. In a lot of cases, you've got a bit of room where you can slide it from one side to the other. At the top of this case, the holes are actually fixed. There's no slide room. It has to go in exactly one place. And with the tubes over to the left-hand side at the top, it wouldn't actually fit with the rear fan in. So you are actually going to have to have your tubes over to the right-hand side. And um, that's just important if you did think you wanted to do it the other way. And the other potential side issue was actually rotating the GAMDS logo on the cooler. It was really, really difficult to actually get that off. Um, so you, it won't actually rotate itself. You're actually going to have to pull the front bit off, turn it round, and then push it back on. So again, for future product development, I think it would be nice to actually be able to rotate that rather than have to do that. In terms of cable management space, this was really good. There was loads of space at the back and I didn't have any difficulty managing the cables, even though I've used cable extensions. So in terms of things I didn't like about the case, um, the biggest issue for me was the SATA powered case fans. Um, I think this is a great looking case and it was just an awful shame to ruin it with SATA powered fans. Although it has to be said, the fans that Gamdeus have used aren't as bad as some other SATA powered fans that I have used. The big issue with them is you've got no way of adjusting the speed. So the fans run at the same speed at idle or whether the PC is under full load. So it generally significantly increases the idle noise levels. Um, and for me, I absolutely hate the idea of them. And in fact, you're probably only going to save a small amount of money by using SATA powered fans rather than ones that have got either DC or PWM control. And I do know GAMDS make good fans that have PWM control. So I think one thing I would like to see improve with this case is to have PWM control for the fans rather than SATA powered. The other things that I think could be improved with the case, I absolutely hate this where cases are come out without all the standoffs installed and no standoff tool in the accessory bag. Um, simple way to fix it, either include the tool to add or remove the standoffs or actually send it out with all the standoffs pre-installed. One of the other decisions I found a little bit strange is the type of USB type A ports we have on the top of the case. We've got two 2.0 ports and one 3.0 port. And using exactly the same cables, we could actually reverse that round and have two 3.0 ports and one 2.0 port. So I'm not quite sure why GAMDS did it that way, but I would like to have seen it the other way round. Um, two other small points to make. Um, in terms of the PCIe slot covers at the back, they're the breakaway type. I much prefer the ones that you remove with a screw and then put back in when you're finished. And in terms of cable management, it all was very good and we got plenty of cable tie down points. Although there did seem to be a few missing over the right hand side for managing your EPS cable. So we'd like to see a few more there. But in general, I've been really impressed with this case given its price point. 
in terms of a budget case, you're getting a case that looks absolutely stunning and actually is fairly good in terms of temperatures and moderately good in terms of noise. So hopefully you have found this video useful. If you have, please remember to give it a thumbs up. And if you're not currently subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button as well. Thanks for watching.